Boy, Tales of Childhood by Roald Dahl The Matron At St. Petersburg, the ground floor was all classrooms. The first floor was all dormitories. On the dormitory floor, the matron ruled supreme. This was her territory. Hers was the only voice of authority up here, and even the 11 and 12-year-old boys were terrified of this female or ogre, for she ruled with a rod of steel. The matron was a large, fair-haired woman with a bo bosom. Her age was probably no more than 28, but it made no difference whether she was 28 or 68 because to us, a grown-up was a grown-up and all grown-ups were dangerous creatures at this school. Once you had climbed to the top of the stairs and set foot on the dormitory floor, you were in the matron's power, and the source of this power was the unseen but frightening figure of the headmaster lurking down in the depths of the study below. At any time she liked, the matron could send you down in your pajamas and dressing gown to report to this merciless giant, and whenever this happened, you got caned on the spot. The matron knew this, and she relished the whole business. She could move along the corridor like lightning, and when you least expected it, her head and her bosom would come popping up through the dormitory doorway. Who threw that sponge? The dreaded voice called out. It was you, Perkins, was it not? Don't lie to me, Perkins. Don't argue with me. I know perfectly well it was you. Now you can put your dressing gown on and go downstairs and report to the headmaster this instant. In slow motion and with immense reluctance, little Perkins, aged eight and a half, would get into his dressing gown and slippers and disappear down the long corridor that led to the back stairs in the headmaster's private quarters. And the matron, as we all knew, would follow after him and stand at the top of the stairs listening with a funny look on her face for the crack, crack, crack of the cane that would soon be coming from below. To me, that noise always sounded as though the headmaster was firing a pistol at the ceiling of his study. Looking back on it now, there seems little doubt that the matron disliked small boys very much indeed. She never smiled at us or said anything nice, and when, for example, the lint stuck to the cut on your kneecap, you were not allowed to take it off yourself, bit by bit, so that it didn't hurt. She would always whip it with a flourish, muttering, Don't be such a ridiculous little baby. We got a new matron. Last one, last term, one night in the walking room, having inflicted a boy called for he kissed him. On one occasion during my first term, I went down to the matron's room to save some iodine, to have some iodine put on a grazed knee, and I didn't know you had to knock before you entered. I opened the door and walked right in, and there she was in the center of the sick room floor, locked in some kind of embrace with the Latin master, Mr. Victor Corrado. They flew apart as I entered and both their faces went suddenly crimson. How dare you come in without knocking, the matron shouted. Here I am trying to get something out of Mr. Quarter's eye and you burst in and disturbed the whole delicate operation. I'm very sorry, matron. Go away and come back in five minutes, she cried. And I shot out of the room like a bullet. After lights out, the matron would prowl the corridor like a panther trying to catch the sound of a whisper behind the dormitory door. And we soon learned that her powers of hearing were so phenomenal that it was safer to keep quiet. Once, after lights out, a brave boy called Rag tiptoed out of our dormitory and sprinkled castor sugar all over the linoleum floor of the corridor. When Rag returned and told us that the corridor had been successfully sugared from one end to the other, I began shivering with excitement. I lay there in the dark in my bed, waiting and waiting for the matron to go on the prowl. Nothing happened. Perhaps, I told myself, she is in her room, taking another speck of dust out of Mr. Victor's corridor's eye. Suddenly, far from down the corridor came a resounding crunch, 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 went the footsteps. It sounded as though a giant was walking on loose gravel. Then we heard the high-pitched, ferocious voice of the matron with distance. Who did this? She was shrieking. How dare you do this? She went crunching along the corridor, flinging open all the dormitory doors and switching on all the lights. The intensity of her fury was frightening. Come along, she cried out, marching with crunching. Up the steps and down the corridor. Own up! I want some of the filthy little boy who put down the sugar. Own up immediately. Step forward. Confess. Don't own up, we whispered to Reg. 
We won't give you away. Red kept quiet. I didn't blame him for that. He had owned up. If he, It was certain his fate had been a terrible and bloody one. Soon the headmaster was summoned from below. The mansion, with steam coming out of her nostril, cried out for, for, to him for help. And now the whole school was herded into the long corridor, and we stood freezing in our pajamas and bare feet while the culprit, or culprits, were ordered to step forward. Nobody stepped forward. I could see that the headmaster was getting very angry indeed. His evening had been interrupted. Red splotches were appearing all over his face, and flecks of spit were shooting out of his mouth as he talked. Very well, he thundered. Every one of you will go at once and get the key to his tuck box. Hand the keys to Matron, who will keep them for the rest of the term. And all parcels coming from home will be confiscated from now on. I will not tolerate this kind of behavior. We handed in our keys, and throughout the remaining six weeks of term, we went very hungry. But all through those six weeks, Arkwell continued to feed his frog with slugs through the hole in the lid on the tuck box. Using an old teapot, he had poured water in through the hole every day to keep the creature moist and happy. I admire Arkel very much for looking after his frog so well. Although he himself was famished, he refused to let his frog go hungry. Ever since then, I have tried to be kind to small animals. Top of page 89. Each dormitory had about 20 beds in it. These were smallish narrow beds ranged along the wall on either side. Down the center of the dormitory stood the basins where you washed your hands and face and did your teeth, always with cold water which stood in large jugs on the floor. Once you had entered the dormitory, you were not allowed to leave unless you were reporting to the matron's room with some sickness or injury. Under each bed there was a white chamber pot, and before getting into your bed you were expected to kneel on the floor and empty your bladder into it. All around the dormitory, just before lights out, was heard the tinkle tinkle of little boys peeing into their pots. Once you had done this and got into your bed, you were not allowed to get out of it again until next morning. There was, I believe, a lavatory somewhere along the corridor, but only an attack of acute diarrhea would be accepted as an excuse for visiting it. A journey to the upstairs lavatory automatically classed you as a diarrhea victim, and a dose of thick white liquid would immediately be forced down your throat by the matron. This made you constipated for a week. Thanks for your letter. These are exactly 23. There are exactly 23 boys with the measles, and all the other bo school boys have got it. Hope Lewis doesn't have anything else wrong. The first miserable homesick night at St. Peter's, when I curled up in bed and the lights were put out, I could think of nothing but the house at home, and my mother and my sisters. Where were they? I asked myself. In which direction from where I was laying was landlocked? I began to work it out, and it wasn't difficult to do this because I had the Bristol Channel to help me. If I looked out of the dormitory window, I could see the channel itself, and the big city of Cardiff with Langloff aside it, alongside it, lay almost directly across the water, but slightly to the north. Therefore, if I turned towards the window, I would be facing home. I wriggled round in my bed and faced my home and my family. From then on, during all the time I was at St. Peter's, I never went to sleep with my back to my family. Different beds and different dormitories required the working out of new directions. But the Bristol Channel was always my guide, and I always was able to draw an imaginary line from my bed to my house over in Wales. Never once did I go to sleep looking away from my family. It was a great comfort to do this. There was a boy in our dormitory during my first term called Tweety, who one night started snoring soon after he had gone to sleep. Who's that talking? called the matron, busting in. My own bed was close to the door, and I remember looking up at her from my pillow and seeing her standing there silhouetted against the light from the corridor and thinking how truly frightening she looked. I think it was her enormous bosom that scared me most of all. My eyes were riveted to it, and to me it was like a battering ram or the bowls of an icebreaker or maybe a couple of high explosive bombs. Oh, and up, she cried. Who was talking? We lay there in silence. Then Tweety, who was laying face fast asleep on his back with his mouth open gave another snore. The matron stared at Tweety. 
Snorting is a disgusting habit, she said. Only the lower classes do it. We shall have to teach him a lesson. She didn't switch the light on, but she advanced into the room and picked up a cake of soap from the nearest basin. The bare electric bulb in the corridor illuminated the whole dormitory in a pale creamy glow. None of us dared to sit up in bed, but all eyes were on the matronome, watching to see what she was going to do next. She always had a pair of scissors hanging by a white tape from her waist, and with this she began shaving thin slivers of soap into the palm of one hand. Then she went over to where the wretched Tweety lay, and very carefully she dropped these little soap flakes into his open mouth. She had a whole handful of them, and I thought she was never going to stop. What on earth is going to happen, I wondered. Would Tweety choke? Would he strangle? Might his throat get blocked up completely? Was he, she going to kill him? The matron stepped back a couple of paces and folded her arms across, or rather underneath, her massive chest. Nothing happened. Tweety kept right on snoring. Then suddenly he began to gurgle, and white bubbles appeared around his lips. The bubbles grew and grew until it, the end his whole face seemed to be smothered in bubbly, foamy, white, frothy soap. It was a horrific sight. Then all at once, Tweety gave a great cough and a sputter, and he sat up very fast and began clawing at his face with his hands. Oh, he stuttered. Oh, 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 no! Whoa, 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 what's happening? Whoa, whoa, what's on my face? Somebody help me! The matron threw him a face flannel and said, Wipe it off, Tweety, and don't ever let me hear you snoring again. Hasn't anyone ever taught you not to go to sleep on your back? And with that, she marched out of the dormitory and slammed the door.